How's everybody doing this morning? I'm doing great, thank you. You know, there's uh, something about facing a room full of happy Christians that does something for you. I just, uh, you need, you guys will start rotating you through here and you can stand up here and just, it's, it's great. It's encouraging. It's the love of God on people's faces and uh, it's, a, it's a blessing. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, this morning we're going to be in uh, Nehemiah and again, once again, um, regardless old or new, when you open the scripture and read, knowing, knowing that it's the word of God, the eternal word of God, Amen. you cannot help but to be encouraged uh, to learn to know that God is in charge, in charge. And so with that in mind, and as I read and study, I always feel like I'm leaving more on the table that I can possibly cover in a lifetime. And I think that's the way God intends it. So with that in mind, uh, let's go ahead and uh, get started. I've asked Randy Fisher to open us up. Randy? Dear Lord. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we're just so thankful we're able to gather here this morning in your name, Lord, be able to freely get together as uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, Lord, in the, in the church body here that gathers in this place, Lord, to share the truth, to hear the truth, to understand the truth, Lord, and take the truth out into the streets of Bella Vista and the world, Lord. I'm thankful that our church is focused on reaching others, making disciples of people, Lord, and sharing the gospel truth of Jesus Christ, who called us to send us to go and reach the lost with you, Lord. We're just thankful that we're here today. We're excited to hear the message of Nehemiah. We'll just pray for Mike as he leads us this morning, Lord, and give us this message clearly and help us all to focus and hear your word today, Lord, and ask you to bless this time together in your holy name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Randy. Praise to your Lord. <coughs> There's a, uh, one question that I'm going to ask. You can say it out loud if you want or just remind yourself. But today we're going to talk about not the, not, the need, not the need for prayer. We all know that. There's no need to go over that again. But what I'm going to ask you to do today is remember back, or today, might have been this morning, I don't know. But I want you to think back on a prayer that was maybe so short, silent maybe, or maybe it was out loud and maybe you're the only one that heard it. Maybe it was that. Maybe you didn't even think about it. It's just something that happened so quick that you had to ask God to help you in some way. And he answered that prayer just like that. I want you to think about that. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. We're going to talk about prayers that we're talking about Nehemiah. And we're going to explore some of his prayers. Some were very formal, some very informal, long, short, silent. We're going to look at those. We're going to be talking about Nehemiah 1 through chapter 1 through chapter 6. And we're just going to touch on those. And then if we have time, I'd like to hear from you share with others, encourage others, that God, whether long or short, formal and informal, silent or loud, that God hears, and if you're his child, he's going to answer you. Now, the answering time, we have Bible indications in the Bible, Daniel in particular, he prayed one prayer, and it was answered nearly instantaneous by the angel Gabriel. He prayed another prayer, and it took infinitely longer than the first time. So as Christians, sometimes we think, well, God didn't answer my prayer. But if the Bible is true, and I believe that it is, he hears those prayers. The answer time may be different. It may not always, depending on what you prayed for. I'll leave that alone. Uh, depending on what you prayed for, 
Uh, but he's going to answer those prayers. So just keep in mind, and that's bad form for me to ask you to think about something else while I'm talking, but that gives me a break because you may miss some of the things that I mess up. So be thinking about that, and then if we have time, I'll ask you to respond to that. Just quickly, just an overview. The book of Nehemiah was uh, written between 445 and 432 B.C., it was the last of the historical books of the Old Testament, and it's also the history of the third return uh, to Jerusalem from Babylonian captivity. Um, this is not a, I've seen it described as an autobiography. It is not. Who knows the difference between a, a memoir and an autobiography? Who knows the difference? There, there's one or two people in this room that know that. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Good. Anybody else? A memoir is typically a about a section or a portion of your life or an event that you record, and that's really what this is about. It's not about Nehemiah's entire life, but it's about a part of his life. Okay. Me personally, I'd rather have read memoirs because they're it seems like there's more attention to a shorter period of time and detail. That's one of my favorite things to read. I'm not a fiction reader. And uh, so anyway, nonetheless, that's what we're dealing with this morning. So uh, this is a first person account. This is important. This is a first person account of how the broken down walls and gates, of which there were 10 gates, uh, and the walls of the city of Jerusalem were rebuilt in 52 days. That may or may not seem like a big deal. Jerusalem at the time was not heavily populated. Okay? It was covered about, there's some disagreement on this, but about 135 acres. Okay? The wall itself in some places, especially the part that Nehemiah worked on, was about 16 foot wide. Okay? 16 foot wide. So the more that you, the wall itself was about two and a half miles around. Now some of you math nerds can do your own homework there. That's, I'm not, so those are really rough figures. But two and a half miles, a wall not rebuilt from the ground up, but repaired plus the gates in 52 days. A little quick math puts that at just about and I'm talking 16 and a half foot wide, puts that at about just short of 100 yards a day of stone and rock by people who aren't professional builders, okay? So that's, in 52 days, that's a significant thing. So we're going to look and see how prayer and God work together to get this done. The main themes of the book uh, are vision, a man with vision, prayer, leadership, <coughs> Leadership is just a fancy word for people that deal with problems and solve them. So when people say they want to be in leadership, I'm going, are you kidding? What's wrong? Let me take your temperature. What's wrong with you? And it also, repentance and revival. Repentance and revival. So today we're going to look at a man named Nehemiah who was a prayer. He, he, he believed in prayer, but he was a mere man, a mere man sent to accomplish the will of God through prayer and action, okay? So then is now. Nothing's changed. God has not changed. The Christian has infinitely more things over Old Testament saints. No question there. But uh, God is, it's, prayer is God's mighty force to accomplish his will. Make no mistake about that. So prayer and action go hand in hand. And one of my favorite verses that I've found in reading this that I think sums it all up, and this is out of Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 9. And Nehemiah says this. He said, "Never." they had been threatened. That's the scene. And Nehemiah says, we made our prayer to God. We made our prayer. We did the important thing first. And then, because of what was going on around them, they set a watch against them, those that were threatening, day and night. So what did they do? 
they prayed first, and then they did what they thought they should do, set a watch or a guard against their enemy. That's a perfect example of what we're going to talk about today. So through prayer, God guides our preparation and diligent efforts. Why? To carry out his will. So again, we're going to talk the prayers of Nehemiah, which, as we mentioned earlier, some are prayer with fasting, short, long, silent, prayers of protection, prayers of judgment, prayers of blessing. Now, the Christian doesn't do the judging. God does the judging. How do we know that? Jesus, he didn't uh, accuse his enemies or anything like that. He didn't do any of that. He, did, he was going to allow the righteous judge to judge him. That's what he was going to do, guide him, do everything. He, he, vengeance was not his at that time. It was God's. Does that make sense? Okay. So let's look together at how Nehemiah used different prayers and actions. Let's go, to, uh, let's go to chapter 1 of Nehemiah. We're going to read through 11, but just for a little context here. And again, Nehemiah is kind of a, um, it's, it's nearly the last piece. Remember, Daniel was a prayer. Daniel prayed all the time. That's what he's known for, right? And then uh, Esther, of course, she asked her own people to fast and pray. She had, she had a big, something big that she had never done before her. So she asked the people to fast and pray. And then now we have Nehemiah. So just a little, just for context here. And where uh, Nehemiah finds himself that despite the fact that the exiles returned to Jerusalem many years before that, um, the walls of the city remain unrepaired, leaving its people defenseless and vulnerable. And it was, a, uh, it was shameful to the people. Uh, the very city that their ancestors were buried in, uh, that was, uh, it was shameful. Ten gates burned, walls torn down. Not a, it didn't have a huge population, quite frankly. Bigger city, not that many people lived there but they were at risk. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and uh, start reading. There's a couple of things I'm going to ask you just to note or jot down in your Bible or on paper. On, your, on, your, uh, t on the tables there, I have some outlines. Uh, the thought here was that if you want to jot down where Daniel prayed, and then on the back there's some archaeological, uh, we'll wait till afterwards, but there's some, arch if you're interested in photos or you kind of, I'm a little nerdy like that. I like that kind of stuff. Pictures, photos, but it shows layout of the walls, what they found in Israel. Parts of it are Nehemiah's wall that still existed. So there's some great little, um, on the back of that sheet, there's some great uh, websites that you can use. And kind of once you start down that road, then one thing leads to another, and pretty soon you're an expert. We'll have you up here next week. And uh, so let me know how that works out. But anyway, very interesting, certainly worth, God intends us to know that what he said is the truth and he's telling the truth. So with that in mind, let me go ahead and read, uh, let's see who's got a, Randy, I tell you what, why don't you go ahead and read uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, in the month of Kisla, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Ananiah, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Then I said. Thank you. A couple of things to mark down. In verse 1, the month that's indicated, that's typically, we believe that to be December. Okay? That's important to remember that. December. And then I want you in verse 4, when it says that once he heard the news of the wall torn down and the gates burned, he sat down and cried. And he refused to eat for several days and spent the time in prayer in the God of heaven. 
December because that's the start date. And what's happening here is that when he heard this news, Nehemiah is beginning to feel and sense the very heart of God for Jerusalem. He's been given that. God is sharing his heart with Nehemiah. How do we know that? Because Nehemiah is beginning to sense um, that um, sorrow that God, this is his city. Jerusalem is his. And uh, it's in disrepair. And his people are in danger. And the heart of God wants to protect his children. Okay? So it's important that we, and again, December. So after receiving the bad news of Jerusalem's wall, seeing the very heart of God. That's how you know sometimes that no matter, once you sense that what you've been given to do, whatever that is in the kingdom of God, you begin to sense. You can't get away from it. You think about it day and night. No matter what you're doing, you're thinking about what God's asked you to do. Okay? And so when you do that, you know that you should have that sense that no matter what you've been asked to do, that he's going to empower you. And as you pray, you're praying really what he wants you to pray. You're praying his will. And what's he going to do? The Bible says that he's going to give you the desires of your heart. What do you think the desires of your heart on a mission for God are going to be? His desires. So that's how you know that if that part is right, that he's going to answer those prayers. Does that make sense? Okay. So let's go ahead and read the prayer that Daniel prayed. Randy, I'm going to wear you out a little bit this morning. I said just the opening prayer, but I had more in mind. I didn't want to overload you right up front. Uh, so let's start. So here's Nehemiah, verse 4. He said, I refused to eat for several days, and I spent the time in prayer to the God of heaven. Randy, if you'd read all the way through there, verse 5, all the way to the end. Just the end of the prayer. Yes. O oh Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and obey his commands, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins with Israel, we Israelites, including myself and my father's house, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly toward you. We have not obeyed the commands decrees and laws you have gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. They are all they excuse me. They are your servants and your people whom you redeem by your great strength and your mighty hand. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this, your servant, and to the prayer of your servants, who delight in the revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was a cupbearer to the king. I tell you what, let's go ahead and... Uh, well, I tell you what... Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll go from there. And then verse, the very first part of chapter 2 says, one day in April, four months later. So you, I want you to, in chapter 1, verse 1, mark December. Chapter 2, the month of April, four months later. Nehemiah prayed the prayer in December, we believe, and it was answered in April. Okay. So what happened? So the occasion was that after receiving bad news about the walls of Jerusalem, uh, we see the very heart of God at work in Nehemiah's life. He recognized God's holiness, and he asked for a hearing. He, not, he was really praying for the nation of Israel, his, the people. So with that in mind, he, was, uh, he confessed not only his sin, but their sin. And he asked for specific help in approaching the king. Okay? He could lose his life, even though his position, and Joe talked about this uh, eloquently last week, 
uh, about the, uh, the man uh, Artaxerxes and his temper and what he was all about. So um, Nehemiah rightly approached the king with uh, respect regardless of his position. So uh, what did the prayer accomplish? Well, it included God in the plans and the concerns, of course. And the prayer prepared the heart of Nehemiah and it gave God, more importantly, room to work. So Nehemiah, as he prayed this prayer, and then it was beginning to be answered as we moved to chapter 2. Our prayers, how often do we pour our hearts out to God like Nehemiah? Make a specific request. You can't live in this world, this life. You cannot without something or someone or some situation. There are things, people in this church right now that are suffering greatly through no fault of their own. Because I think, uh, if I can use the words of a political commentator, those people are spiritually right over the target that they're supposed to be. And if in combat, if you've, if you've been in... Uh, or read the accounts of World War II films or Vietnam or even the most current. When you're the closer to the target you get, the more the enemy's going to throw everything they've got at you. Amen. To the point that you're going to go, what in the world is going on? Yes. That's what that means. If you're if you're focused on the living God and his will and that kind of stuff starts happening, that's that's called get on your knees time. Because you're over the target and God is using you in a way maybe you never expected. And that's the time to, you can say, Lord, what is going on here? But I'm telling you today that that's probably it. Okay? So double down and uh, devil beware. So uh, when you pour your heart out and make a specific request, that's prayer. Let's keep our faith, rather. Let's move on to... Uh, Let's go into chapter, uh, chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. Randy, if you'll go ahead and read that. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. Come on, you guys, get together over there. You get what you pay for, right? What was the one you read? Wake up, 1 through 6. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Exterparis, when wine was brought in for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before, so the king asked me, Why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, May the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my fathers are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? The king said to me, what is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven, and I answered the king, If it pleases the king, and if your servant was found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah, where my fathers are buried, so that I can rebuild it. To six, yeah. Um, then the king, with the queen sitting beside him, asked me, How long will your journey take, and when will you be back? It pleased the king to send me, so I said, time. All right. Notice in, thanks Randy, notice in, so he approaches four months later, okay, he prayed back in December. God, the reason for the answer, I'm assuming the Bible doesn't say that. You may have your own opinion, but I believe that uh, God was pr preparing the heart of Artaxerxes. That's what yes. I believe. Okay. Why? Because um, that's, uh, where, where does the Bible say that the king's heart who is? Whose, whose hand is the king's heart, what he does in decisions? Whose hand is that in? The Lord. Yeah. We may think that they put them. No. God places. He raises. He sits down. So he, he was using that time not only for Artaxerxes, I believe, but also to prepare the heart of Nehemiah, more importantly. Okay? But listen to this quick prayer. And now, this is not in all translations, but the quick prayer when the king says, so, so what, what is it you want me? What, what is it? What do you want? And it says here in uh, chapter 2, uh, right after verse 4, he says, with a, with a quick prayer to God of heaven. 
In some translations, if you have another one, let me know. But mine says, here's where you can help God. So he was face to face with the most powerful man that he knew saying, what do you want? And in that split second, Nehemiah knew his heart had been prepared. He knew exactly what he needed. But just in case, just in case, he says, uh, he cries out and he says, here's where you can help God. And in that split second, what does it take to say that? A couple of seconds? But I guarantee you that God had prepared his heart in that heart of faith. There was as much faith in that, in that prayer. He didn't know that day was coming. Nehemiah didn't know that. He didn't know that's what the king was going to say that day. But he was prepared. God had prepared his faith. His faith and that request was just as powerful as the one he prayed in chapter 1. So, uh, conversation with the king, the quick prayer, and uh, it accomplished, it put the expected results uh, in God's hands. So, our prayer is giving God credit beforehand, okay? And then it keeps us from taking more credit than we should. And uh, I think we would all admit, at least to ourselves, that our flesh loves loves to take credit, especially after God's done the heavy lifting. Before that, we're on our knees, oh, please, God, help me. We're helpless. But once it, uh, it's accomplished and noticed, uh, flesh's tendency to go, boy, I tell you, I did great on that. Well, that's a dangerous position to be in. Let's move on. Um, well, let's go to uh, chapter, chapter 2, uh, verses 7 through 10, verses 7 through 10, and this is where we get uh, the intro to some of the antagonists. Just a quick note here, the journey from Jerusalem, I'm sorry, from Shushan to Jerusalem was about a thousand miles. It wasn't a direct journey, so about a thousand miles. I use this as a timeline to confirm, not that I, but just for this class, it took about three months to get from Shushan, the Fertile Crescent was the direction to Jerusalem. So if the prayer was answered in April, three months from Shushan to Jerusalem, that puts us sometime in August. Does that sound right? The wall was finished in September, okay? So somewhere July, August is when he got to Jerusalem, okay? So he had plenty of time to prepare himself he knew what was ahead of him, but God was using that time to prepare him, to strengthen him, to encourage him, to be thinking about what he was going to need to accomplish. So uh, if you would, Randy, verse, uh, chapter 2, verses 7 through 10. <laughs> I also said to him, if it pleases the king... May I have letters to the governors of Transphrates so that they will provide me safe conduit until I arrive in Judah. And may I have a letter to Esaph, keeper of the king's forest, so he will give me timber to make themes for the gates of the citadel, by the temple and for the city wall and for the residence I will occupy. And because the gracious hand of my God was upon me, the king granted my request. So I went to the governors of the Transphrates and gave them the king's letters. The king had also sent army officers and cavalry with me. When Sambalat, the Horonite, and Tobiah, the Ammonite official, heard about this, they were very much disturbed that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. So in verse 10, um, well, just to back up a bit, Nehemiah had the wherewithal. The king was uh, shaking his head yes. And when the king's saying yes, that's when Nehemiah said, well, in addition to that, I also need. So that was, that was I thought that was pretty courageous, actually. You know, he got one thing, but actually, I, I think that's a great school. I love that. When somebody's saying yes, well, let's go ahead and, let's go ahead and, what, if there's anything else, let's go. My father always taught me that if you have any need, that's serious. Don't waste, don't waste the man's time. But if you have a serious need, you go directly to the man who writes the check. And I found that those folks are more willing to say yes 
and keep nodding their head, and that's when you begin to, if you're on God's behalf, you uh, go for the gold, so to speak, okay? Because they are there whether they know it or not. Uh, if they're opposed to God's mission in this world, whether they know it or not, they really work for him, okay? So when you're talking to someone who may not be a believer, uh, don't be afraid to remember that you're a child of the king, okay? So if, once you get that mindset, then you're a little more likely to be bold when it counts, okay? So with that in mind, uh, this is where in, in verse 10, this is the introduction of uh, the antagonist in this story. Okay, these are the guys right here, Sanballat and Tobiah. And they were very angry, it says, that anyone was interested in helping Israel. Same today for the Christian. So, uh, let's, uh, so the, uh, let's go to chapter 4, verse 1 through 5. Chapter 4, 1 through 5. Randy, thank you. When Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews in the presence of his associates in the army of Samaria. He said, what are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble? burned as they are. Tobiah, the Ammonite, who was at his tape side, said, what, are, what they are building, if even a fox climbed up on it, he would break down their walls of stone. Hear us, O our God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in the land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or plot out their sins from your sight. For they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. Okay, in, uh, let me do the last part first. It says, he says here in this version, he says, when he's praying, he said, they, his enemies, have despised you in despising us, okay? So when you're doing the Lord's work, whatever that may be, and you run into opposition, it, it's not about you. It's about God. You just happen to be standing there. You're going to get the, the, the brunt of everything. But it's not about you. The fight is not with you. You get, the, you get, you get, the, uh, you get to participate, but it's about the enemy of your soul, the enemy of God, and uh, you just happen to be there. And thank God you get to participate. Chuck? Israel has always had enemies watching what they're doing. And so do Christians, Chuck. Always. Always. And it's, it's going to be that way until the yes, Lord comes back. And then, when he comes back to the earth and establishes his kingdom, it's going to be a different yes. day. So anyway, he's uh, to back up into the prayer. This is something that, as Christians, I don't believe, I believe the Lord proved that, that we don't need to be doing, which is, he says, do not, in verse 5, do not ignore their sin, do not blot it out. And... Uh, so basically saying, you know, sick them, God, just go ahead and let's go ahead and rip these guys up right now. The Lord teaches us to pray for our enemies, okay? That may be one of the more difficult things in this life, especially if they've smacked you pretty good or affected your family in some way. The flesh's immediate response is, uh, we're going to get even with these guys. But that is not what the Lord would have us do. It's to pray and that he might be glorified. And we're to imitate, not imitate, but to be empowered by Jesus to do what he did. Let's move on to, so just a quick, so the enemies were taunting and ridiculing what they were doing. And they, uh, I guess the part I, I admire the most about Nehemiah is he expressed his anger to God. Okay? Uh, if you don't watch out, we express it out loud to the person that's given us aggravation. But uh, he expressed his anger to God, and he didn't take matters into his own hands. That is, that may be, yes? No, no. I was just thinking, the battle is the Lord's, what Nehemiah said, and he 
That's right. Said, I will not fear what man can do. That's that's perfect. Thanks, Barb. Uh, so our prayers, we tend to do the opposite. We take matters into our own hands. We don't tell God. It. We tell after the fact sometimes. So this is as much. This is one of those things. Uh, when I read that, I'm talking to myself as much as anyone else. And then the devil usually reminds me of the time that I didn't do what I was supposed to do. But nonetheless, let's go on to, uh, let's see, let's go to 4, 6, 3, 9, let's move ahead just a little bit. Let's go to chapter 5, Randy, chapter 5, uh, 14, 5, 14 through 19. Moreover, from the 20th year of King Exterus, when I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, until his 32nd year, 12 years, neither I nor my brothers ate the food allotted to the governor. But the earlier governors, those preceding me, placed a heavy burden on the people and took 40 shekels of silver from them in addition to food and wine. Their assistants also lorded it over the people. But out of the reverence for God, I did not act like that. Instead, I devoted myself to the work on this wall. All my men were assembled there for the work. We did not acquire any land. Furthermore, 150 Jews and officials ate at my table, as well as those who came to us from the surrounding nations. Each day, one ox, six choice sheep, and some poultry were prepared for me. And every 10 days, an abundant supply of wine of all kinds, in spite of all this, I never demanded the food allotted to the governor, because the demands were heavy on those, these people. Remember me with favor, O oh my God, for all I have done for these people. All right. Just in uh, back up to 16, I thought this was interesting. It said that with all the things going on in verse 16, this translation says, I stayed at work on the wall and refused to speculate in land. He could have enriched himself. I mean, he was in a position to do it, and uh, they were looking to him for leadership, so he could have done that easily. But he didn't do it. That was a perfect example, I think, of leadership. He's showing what he's showing what he wants them to do. I, you know, I'm, I provide all these things. I feed these people, and I do this, but I get out and I work just like everybody else. That, to me, that is leadership. Uh, you show people what you show them, what you want them to imitate or do. That's why it's important to always, before you follow anyone, anyone on this planet, watch what they do. Does what they say match what they want you to do? If not, either have a conversation or look at somebody else, okay? That's a key. A lot of talk, not a lot of walk, okay? And, but, and remember, you know, different folks are gifted in different ways, so take that into account, but generally that's the case. Let's move on to uh, chapter 6, verse 9. Chapter 6, verse 9. Uh, Randy, if you would, uh, 1 through 6. Chapter 6, verse 1 through 6. I'm sorry, boy, that, pardon me. Six, nine. Six, nine, nine okay, six. Let me, coffee. Uh, <laughs> chap, chapter, who said that? Get up here. Uh, chapter six, verses one through six. Let's do that, okay? Yep. When word came to Santa Ana, but to buy a Geshem, Arab and the rest of our enemies that I had rebuilt the wall, and not a gap was left in it, though up to that time I had not set the doors in the gates. Sanballat and Geshem sent me this message, Come, let us meet together in one of the villages on the plain of Ona. But they were scheming to harm me, so I sent messengers to them with this reply, I am carrying on a great project and cannot go down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and go down to you? Four times they sent me the same message, and each time I gave them the same answer. And the fifth time, Samuel sent his aid to me with the same message. 
and in his hand was an unsealed letter to which was written. It is reported among the nations, and Geshem says it is true that you and the Jews are plotting to revolt, and therefore you are building the wall. Moreover, according to these reports, you are about to become their king, and, and have even appointed prophets to make this proclamation about you in Jerusalem. There is a king in Judah. Now this report will get back to the king, so come, let us confer together. I sent him this reply. Did you say go to nine? Yes, let's go ahead. I didn't say it, but let's go ahead and do it. I sent him this reply. Nothing like what you are saying is happening. You are just making it up out of your head. They were all trying to frighten us, thinking their hands will get too weak for the work and it will not be completed. But I prayed, now strengthen my hands. Okay. So what's happening here is they were going to say that they had done everything they could think of. Now they're going to assassinate him. That's what they're going to do. We've had enough. We've been as nice as we can be. And, uh, but this guys uh, he's getting too close to uh, finishing what he started. And if we take him out, everybody else is going to scatter. Remember what the scripture said about Jesus. The shepherd was struck and the flock scattered. It's the same thing. That's why it's important. Let me always, that's why it's important to make disciples. Why? Because if you make disciples that make disciples that make disciples, you're not dependent on one person. If Nehemiah, and I have to believe that he did, but the scripture doesn't say that specifically. But another thing about leadership, and that's what this book is about as well, is that you make disciples so it doesn't depend. Jesus, the God-man, did what? He made disciples. Why? So they could continue the work after he was no longer here in the flesh. He, he sent his spirit back. That's why it's important to multiply. That's what discipleship is. It's multiplication to get people to do what you're doing so that it doesn't rest on one person. Okay? In this particular case, Nehemiah knew that that's what these guys were up to. That's called discernment. That's a spiritual gift uh, for, uh, certainly for the New Testament believer. But it's discernment. It's smart to know what your enemies are doing and what they're thinking. God will give the Christian that discernment. You'll just know it. If somebody's not right, you should, God will tell you that. He'll, he'll, it does, they're saying something that doesn't pass the smell test. And you'll just sense it. Somebody will say, how do you know that? Well, I just know it. So that's kind of what, so what did he tell them? What did he say? Leave me alone. You're lying. Get out of here. I know I'm not going to do what you want. My mission is this. I'm not going to be sidetracked by this stuff. You've already proven who you are and what you're about. I'm going to stay on mission. I'm going to continue to pray, and that's exactly what he did. His prayer was, oh, Lord God, please strengthen me. Now, this guy's up here working and sweating. It's hot in Jerusalem. Yes. So he's got, he's got, he's not only get, has the work, the responsibilities. We're going to get into a few more of those here in a minute. He has all that responsibility, plus the protection of the people, plus the enemies. Nehemiah is right over the target. He's doing exactly what he's supposed to be doing. How do we know that? Because he has opposition on every side. Plus, they're trying to knock him off. Okay? This is one tough guy. Why? Because he knows why he's there. Once you have that, there's nothing that can stop you if you believe God is for you and not against you. Okay? So, let's, uh, so the prayer accomplished this. It showed reliance uh, on God for stability. So the question is, how often do you ask for help when under pressure? Well, I'm a big sissy, and if it gets, I mean, if it even looks like it's going to be tough, I'm going to go, Jesus, help me now. Yes. That's probably the longest prayer I pray when I don't have time. One time I remember just saying, I barely squeaked out the words, help. And just like that, boom. It happened. It was life or death, literally. Life or death. I, I don't even remember getting to the P on the help. I just said it was hell, and it was, and God answered the prayer. 
okay? And if we pay attention, I think we may find more of those in, in our life than we realize. Let's move on to, uh, let's move on to, uh, let's see, verses 10 through 14. If you didn't, go ahead and 10 through 14. One day I went to the house of Shemaiah, son of Deliah, the son of Mehetabel, who was shut in his home. He said, let us meet in the house of God inside the temple and let us close the temple doors because men are coming to kill you. By night they are coming to kill you. But I said, should a man like me run away or should one like me go into the temples to save his life? I will not go. I realize that God has not sent him, but that he had prophesied against me, because Tobiah and Sanibel had hired him. He had been hired to intimidate me so that I would commit a sin by doing this, and then they would give me a bad name to discredit me. Remember Tobiah and Sanibel, oh my God, because of what they have done. Remember also the prophetess, Nodiah, and the rest of the prophets who have been trying to intimidate me. Okay, so here he's, ba he's asking God to remember his enemies who are trying to put fear in him. Fear, the opposite of faith. Fear will stop you every time if you allow it. And the Bible says it, what's, what's not faith is what? Fear. And, and another way of saying that, if it's not faith, it's sin because you're not believing what God is saying. Okay? That's some, and we're all, we're all involved in that. In some shape, form, or fashion, fear in some place in our life. Yes? We need to face our fears with our promise from God. That's right. Thank you, Don. So that's it. It's the believing of the scripture. That's really it. And uh, knowing that God's with you and not against you. Randy, let's go ahead and finish this up. Uh, 15 through 16, chapter 6. <clears throat> so the wall was completed on the 20th. <clears throat> on the 25th of Elul, in the 52 days, when all our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their self-confidence, because they realized that the work had been done with the help of our God. Also in those days, the nobles of Judah were sending many letters to Tobiah, and replies from the Tobiah kept coming to them. For many in Judah were under oath to him. Since he was son-in-law to Shechaniah, son of Era, and the son of Jehonan, and married the daughter of Meshahon, son of Herkaria. Sorry, Randy. I don't know his word, but sorry. Moreover, they kept reporting to me his good deeds and then telling him what I said. And Tobias sent letters to intimidate me. We're going to wrap. Yeah. He'll be here all week, folks. <laughs> So just to wrap this up, there's a formality in the very first prayer that we examined in Nehemiah chapter 1. It was a very formal prayer. But it was that formal prayer, if you will, and God placing his will in Nehemiah's heart that led to the faith that allowed Nehemiah, when he was under pressure, being threatened, all the things that go with the job he was given, the faith was there that those quick prayers were answered. Okay? So it's those on-the-job prayers. That's what I call them, on-the-job prayers. And uh, there's a room full of people around, and it's probably not appropriate or beneficial to get on your knees in the middle and start praying out loud, oh, God. Now you get some conversation going, but uh, there's a time for that, and there's a time for that whispered prayer as well. I'm not saying that one is better than another. I'm just saying that, one, that the short prayers can be as effective as anything else. And the, uh, the key here is that it's, number one, prayed in faith and that the Lord hears and answers. Just uh, for the Christian today, a couple of quick points. Number one, realize you're in a spiritual battle. Okay? There's only two things going on in this planet, really. Two things. One is what the Lord God is doing, and the other is what the enemy is doing. Everything else is conversation. Okay? So realize you're in a spiritual battle. Uh, Ephesians 6, and then number 2, pray. What did Jesus say? He said, men ought always to pray and not lose heart. That's Luke 18. In James 5, 16, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man. A righteous man is a believer, okay? 
and he's able to accomplish much. That's the amplified version. And that's what our friend Nehemiah did all the time, every time. And third and finally, praise and thank him for all he's done. And you do that while you're praying. Don't do it after the fact you can, but you thank him for what you just prayed for. Why? Because you, that shows you're praying in faith, and you believe God heard you, and he's going to answer you, and thank him for it. Philippians 4, 6 says, what? Don't worry about anything. Pray about everything. Tell the Lord what you need. Thank him for all he's done. And then finally, 1 Thessalonians 5.16, rejoice always. That's the key. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Randy, we pray? Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this message, Lord. Um, and just pray, Lord, for your blessing. Give thanks for all your blessings today, Lord. Um, as you brought this message, Lord, as it uh, works its way into our hearts and minds, and we realize the blessings we do have from you every day, Lord. And when you call us, Lord, to go and do things, Lord, that uh, we do get on our knees and pray about those, Lord, and we give thanks to you for what you called us to do and, and how you'll make us handle these situations, Lord. But we give you all thanks and praise for your blessings each and every day, Lord. And thankful for your continual teaching, Lord, and your work in each one of our lives, Lord. As you use each one of us as we're called to be used for the kingdom, Lord, to do whatever it may be, Lord, that we will humble ourselves before you, Lord, and be thankful for the blessings on the way. We thank you for Mike's teaching today, the blessings that he brought, his words through the Bible, Lord, that come to us and to our ears and our heart, Lord, that we use them and know that you are around us at all times and all places, Lord. We can count on you for all things. We give all things to you in your holy name. Amen. Just quickly, all those prayers that I ask you to remember, those short prayers, well, we don't have time for those. But you need to thank God and, and remember what those can do and remind yourself of what he's done in the past because what he's done in the past, he'll do in the future as well. God bless. Amen. You bet.